Industrial Revolution by Hussein Patel. So how big was the Industrial Revolution? How big? Uh, absolutely massive. It was uh, world changing. <laughs> in this video today, we will be focusing on three main factors that were vital in the Industrial Revolution. The Liverpool docks, Manchester and the railway that connected these two cities. These three factors work together like a well-oiled machine, helping make and distribute large amounts of textile materials, which was mostly cotton. The Liverpool docks imported raw materials from other countries, mostly from southern states of America, where slavery was active. When the materials got to Liverpool, no time was wasted, they put the materials onto a train heading to Manchester. In Manchester, these materials were put into factories to make into finished products, like cotton plants into bales of cotton. When the bales of cotton were finished, as soon as possible, they put them back onto a train going back to Liverpool. Here, they were simply put on a ship and distributed around the world. We start our journey in Manchester. Manchester was once a small town which was populated with less than 15,000 people. But by 1780, once the Industrial Revolution kicked in, the population rose to 20,000 and kept on rising. Today, the city holds around over 500,000 people. Because of the Industrial Revolution, Manchester became the world's first industrialised city. The expansion of Manchester brought a lot of positive aspects to the city. Canals were being built and factories started to rise beside them. In the earlier days, factories used the flowing water from canals to power the machinery by having a water wheel like this but on a much larger scale. However, in the 1775, James Watt created and introduced the steam engine with the help of his partner, Matthew Bolton. This was one of the most substantial technological improvements in the Industrial Revolution. Now, the steam from the engine powered the wheel. This meant that the water-powered energy became obsolete. The steam engine was more powerful and more efficient than the water power. Factories started to rise everywhere because there was no need for water. Also, the water power had a lot of problems. The main one was the weather. Having a dry spell in the summer decreased the water level. And in the winter, they would freeze over, leaving the wheel still until someone broke the ice. The rise of the factories and the demand for coal to power the steam engines increased, which created yet another big surge in the population. Demand was so massive that they needed machines. And you had the famous inventors like Arkwright, Crompton, uh, people like that, Hargreaves, they invented the spinning machines. Uh, <clears throat> they had to build the first factory because the machines got so big that they couldn't be used in a house anymore. So Arkwright built the, one of the first factories up at Cromford and then as they started to build them in the city they needed people. So thousands of people moved into the city and as we tell people in our, um, our demonstrations to, for that demand you needed lots of housing. Uh, houses were very quickly built, very badly built. Uh, you could get more than one family living in a house. Uh, you could get more than one family living in a room. A doctor did a survey in 1860 because there was no proper sanitation to speak of. And he found that there would be one toilet, which was outside maybe in a courtyard, for 125 people. Uh, so obviously people used buckets, chamber pots, emptied them into the street 
Uh, this soaked down into the ground and poisoned the only fresh water supply they had, which came from the ground, from underground, uh, to hand pumps on street corners and in courtyards. However, disease outbreaks weren't the only big killer. In those days, the machine they used to make cotton also killed a lot of people. The worst job on the picture, there's another person here, a little bit more hidden on the bottom right corner under the threads. That's probably the worst job. whole industry that's the scavenger and again that would have been the smallest child you could find before 1833 a child as young as five 1833 saw the first factory reform act which one of the clauses was the under nines clause so no one below the age of nine could work in the factory which seems strange that you would still let a nine-year-old do that job because the job of the scavenger was again cleaning up but um, they thought that the scavenger would get in the way of everyone else if they were allowed around the front of the machine. So they were sent round the back and they had to crawl underneath the machine, underneath the threads, and wipe up any oil on, and fibre. Now, when it operates, you'll see that this carriage takes maybe eight or nine seconds to come to the front, but then it smashes back in like three or four. So out of all those 12 seconds you spent a good portion of your whole working day just running for your life and of course machines don't slow down and people do so there were a lot of lots of kids killed by these machines so we'll give you a bit more of an idea of how it works just imagine the life of those poor scavengers having to scurry out every time it goes crashing back in There wasn't any machine that couldn't kill you and it could happen to anyone including the most experienced person. People who'd been doing the job for many many years and they, like one particular accident was a, a man who got his arm um, caught in a curdin engine and he was um, a technician. Um, today's modern curdin and modern machinery has lots of magic eyes and what the technician wanted to do was to see the revolving cylinder so he had to block the magic eye because the doors were open and he was inside the machine he had to block the magic eye so that it was carry on running and he got his arm caught and it didn't stop and it ripped his arm off at the elbow Manchester was once known as an evolving and a world leading city. It was given the nickname Cottonopolis. And now the factories and the mills have been demolished for new buildings and even turned into offices and apartments. Manchester is most well known for football teams now. The railway from Manchester to Liverpool wasn't the only way factories used to send their cotton. Before the railways had been built, canals and horse and carriages were used, but mostly canals. This was because boats could carry more and there was a less chance of the stock getting stolen. 
The railway between Manchester and Liverpool was the world's first inner city railway. However, getting permission to build the railway was first denied. Ralph Allen was the first man to think of this idea. But it got rejected because the canal workers complained that no one would use the canals anymore. This would evidently be true because using the train would be quicker and less costly. Finally, in 1826, Parliament granted permission to build the railway. The railway would connect Manchester and Liverpool. As a cause to find the best train to run on the line, it was decided a competition would be held called Rainhill Trials and the best train would be picked to run on the line. The Rainhill Trials were held in October 1829. The winner, Robert Stevenson, and his locomotive called Rocket. After the Rocket, there have been many trains that have followed. However, there is only one called the Lion that survives. This train is in the Liverpool Museum. At the Museum of Science and Industry, they have a replica that is fully functioning and it is rideable. Also, the track the train runs on is in the same place as the original track used to be. The museum is built around the platform that was there in the Industrial Revolution era. Most of the canals have been closed now. One of the reasons behind Manchester being successful was mostly down to Liverpool being so close. Liverpool was the door to international trade. Raw materials came in and cotton went out. At one point, the North West supplied 70% of the world's cotton. The railway didn't just stop at the docks, but they built a line running across it too. This meant the train would stop just outside the preferred dock and was ready to be loaded onto a ship. Like Manchester, Liverpool had improvements and innovations happening, although it wasn't as big as the steam engine or the machinery. They thought up ideas how to improve loading. They got rid of the house and carriage which took the materials to and from the ship and train. They improved it by swapping it with a tractor. Also, like Manchester, Liverpool wasn't a pleasant place. Although Liverpool didn't have the black smog that Manchester had because of the factories constantly pouring the smoke out. The streets at the docks were dark and you could just as easily get robbed, beaten up or even killed for the long hours you've worked for that day. 
This is a reconstruction of how it looked and felt in those streets. The difference between Manchester and Liverpool now is that Manchester has moved away from its roots and moved towards finance and media and Liverpool has improved but stayed with its roots. It is still a thriving shipping community. Both cities have improved and wouldn't be as successful and big if the industrial revolution never happened. However, it's sad to say the people of Manchester have forgotten about what happened and what made their city. It is forgotten in a way, yeah, and it, it is really sad because it was a, a massive industry. It's like the, when they used to do the deep mining. I mean, there are no deep mines anymore. And, I mean, what those people in those jobs went through was horrendous. But that now is gradually being forgotten along with textiles. But my job along with everybody else here is to keep that alive and I mean we get people in who worked in the industry and they just want to talk about it you know I remember this I remember and it's great getting their things their memories down on paper which we do How do you feel about working with the museum and exhibition? It's a fabulous job. It's an absolutely fabulous job. Uh, I would have just stayed in the factories, but obviously, like everything else, they started to close down. And uh, I started here as a demonstrator in the textile gallery. Uh, later on we got the chance, I went to learn the steam engines in the power hall and things like that. Now again I'm here training, so we have quite a large team now of explainers and I train the explainers in the, with the textile machinery. So it's great getting these young people and um, they've never even seen these machines and now they can do demonstrations on them for the public. Plus, I get the chance to tell children who will never ever see the inside of a corn factory, never know the terrible things that happened in there and how terrible life was for people. But now we can get it across to them. And I think at the end of a demonstration, the children can really appreciate the type of good life that they have today. Thank you.